Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where two friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Oh yeah, don't you know it? We've got a very Midwestern pairing today. I'm very excited. We sure do. Not much of an accent in this particular place. No, but it is part of the Midwest, right? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to it, I'm assuming. We'll get to it. Uh, Yeah, we'll get to the topic. Yeah. (laughs) So... (laughs) I'm Lucy. Oh, right. I'm Amanda. I'm putting the sleeves on my monstrosity of a sweater, but I'm very proud of her. I can't wait for that She's coming together, y'all. She'll be (laughs) done in time for next winter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got time. Or a chilly or summer evening. Chilly summer evening. You never mm-hmm. know. These Midwest temps, they're unpredictable. They really are. I'm mm-hmm. it's been very nice here the last oh. couple the last week or so, but I'm really scared that we're gonna have that second, third winter. It could happen. Because we're only in early it's March only as March. we record this. It's only March. For those listening, it might be April, but where we are. It's March. Mm -hmm. Well, today we have a very special fan pick brought to you by Courtney Lombardo. Courtney Lombardo. And for some reason, Courtney has chosen the topic of hideous huskers. Could it be that Courtney lives in Nebraska? Probably. That's probably why. I mean, I maybe either Courtney lives in Nebraska or Courtney just really loves Nebraskan culture. She's one of the people from Nebraska. Yep. One of the I seven assume. people <laughs> who live in Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Courtney, here's your fan pick. And uh, <laughs> I have some, like, shockingly weird information about Nebraska. because well, I have a horrifying case that was recommended by Courtney. So we're getting it all from all ends. Fabulous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I can't wait to get started. So, Amanda, what is our wine crime pairing for Hideous Huskers? Courtney specifically recommended a drink that I love so much <laughs> and am so sad that I cannot drink today. Why? Uh, well, okay. You know that yesterday I had to take a sick day because I had a gastroparesis flare. Yes. And I am feeling better today, like much better, but not, I don't trust my stomach enough to do alcohol, period, but especially a Bloody Mary. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Because I like them spicy, that tomato juice is acidic. Like I just, I personally couldn't do it. So I actually have a couple of little pink joints that I put together for myself earlier that I will be Love cracking that. into. But um, just because I can't drink the pairing doesn't mean we can't discuss the pairing. So I wanted to give a brief background on the Bloody Mary, what constitutes a Bloody Mary. And Courtney specifically wanted really fun fixins. So I also went down a, a very shallow rabbit hole of like, some of the wildest Bloody Marys from bars across the United States. And I did put some photos on the drive, which will be on the blog for you to look at Lucy, because some of these garnishes are absolutely fucking batshit and they're so funny and we'll, we'll get to them, but uh, they're shocking and I love them. This feels like a Wisconsin pairing. This does feel very Wisconsin. Wisconsin loves their bloodies and loves Mm -hmm. to go like balls to the wall on the garnishes, but yes, the, the Bloody Mary, as a as a basic, is a cocktail containing vodka, tomato juice, other spices and flavorings, including Worcestershire sauce, hot sauces, which, like, I'm a Tabasco girly. That's kind of the classic, but you can get really fun with your hot sauces. Garlic, herbs, horseradish, celery, olives, and pickled vegetables are kind of the classic, and, like, a lime 
slice are like a classic garnish. Mm -hmm. Or a lemon. Lemon, yep. A little bit of the cit- citrusy acid, which actually is great to help cut the spice. If you if your if your bloody is too spicy and you're having a hard time drinking it, even with like a beer back, ask for extra lemons or extra limes, and that'll help level out the spice. Didn't know that. Yeah, it helps a lot. They will have salt, not only on the rim, but also in the mix. Black pepper, lemon juice, lime juice, celery salt. Some versions of the drink, such as the Surf and Turf Bloody Mary, include shrimp and bacon as garnishes. Yeah, that's what I like. Mm-hmm. The Bloody Mary was invented in, they're not 100% sure, but around the 1920s and 1930s. And there are various theories as to the origin of the drink and its name. And it has a ton of different variants, most notably the quote unquote red snapper and uh, which is also called the bloody Mar- Margaret. You can also make a bloody Maria with tequila. Mm-hmm. There's another bloody something or other that can be made with gin. And as a gin girly, that does not sound very good to me. No, those flavors don't sound like a good mix. Yeah. And uh, I know a lot of folks will also default to Clamato, which is the clam and tomato juice, but that's not the classic Bloody Mary. And I find merely the thought of Clamato physically <laughs> repulsive. I also think Clamato as a word is very upsetting. Clamato is... Disgust. Clamato Clamato. I mean, I don't mind a Clamato in the bloody, but uh, yeah, it doesn't really taste like clams. I No, thank you. Okay. It is alleged that it was first introduced by French bartender Ferdinand Petois, who claimed to have invented the Bloody Mary in 1921, well before any of the later claims, according to his granddaughter. But this has a very (laughs) specific failed verification on Wikipedia, so I don't know. But according to legend, he was working at the New York bar in Paris at the time, which later became Harry's New York bar, a frequent Paris hangout for Ernest Hemingway and other American migrants. And the cocktail was said to have been created on the spur of the moment, according to the bar's own traditions, consisting of only vodka and tomato juice. It was originally referred to as a, quote, bucket of blood. Bring back that name. Ooh, I kind of like that. I knew you would. And Harry's Bar also claims to have created numerous other classic cocktails, including the White Lady and the Sidecar. Mmm. New York's 21 Club also has claims associated with being home of the original Bloody Mary. To me, this is very similar to how Minneapolis has multiple bars that claim to be home of the Juicy Lucy, multiple burger bars. Mm -hmm. So I just think we'll never quite know, but it was around since like about the 20s. Okay. So yeah. And it's, you know, usually like a brunch drink or a hangover cure, but I'm super down for drinking a Bloody Mary at all hours of the day. Mm -hmm. I think they're fucking great. Do you remember that time we were in the we were at the Irish pub in Excelsior and after a night of drinking and I was like, oh, I just need a Coke. I, I'll i take a Coke. And she, the, our server was like, is Pepsi OK? And I was like, no, I'll have a no, Bloody Mary. Uh, yeah, absolutely <laughs> fucking not. And uh, frankly, how dare you ask? And we're leaving. Yes. Yep. Check, please. I'll take my check. You didn't order anything. Great. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so Thrillist had this great list of, quote, 13 insane Bloody Marys that have gone too far. I love and that. And that's where these photos are that are on the drive. So I'm not going to go over all of them, but I wanted to touch on some of the ones that I included. So the one that has like a full shrimp boil on it. Let's see. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this my is, God. It's shocking. The shrimp boil skewers there's also Ooh. pieces of um netting on it for aesthetic there's a effect. full crab with the with the I almost said antlers with the claw the legs claws. and the claws yep there's a full crab there's roasted potatoes i think there's chunks of grilled chicken yeah it's incredible oh. this is from Phillips Seafood Baltimore restaurant so if you're coming to Baltimore for the crabs be sure to stop at Phillips Seafood for the seafood smorgasbord known as the crab deck which comes topped with a tangled net of crabs, shrimp, potatoes, and chicken wings for some protein variety. Oh, my God. This I can't even look at this anymore. That it sounds... looks so good. 
horrible. <laughs> I know we shouted out Wisconsin earlier, but Sobelman's Pub and Grill yes. in Milwaukee. I've been there. I yep. was going to bring this up. That was my lunch. <laughs> Sobelman's is known for their rotating menu of wild Bloody Marys, but none is more legendary than the Bloody Beast, yes. which comes not only with skewers of sausage, cheese, veggies, olives, which like the sausage, cheese, veggie, olive, and like celery lime garnish is very midwest almost every good bloody that you'll get will have like a cured meat in it Mm -hmm. but this has shrimp bacon wrapped jalapeno cheese balls and cheeseburgers (laughs) you can also get one with an entire like the whole thing fried chicken (laughs) it's market price basically (laughs) <laughs> but the meaty monstrosity redeems itself by donating $5 of its $50 price tag to a local charity. Yeah. Uh, it's the least they can do. <laughs> it's a buffet. It's, it's a buffet. It's a lot. And this photo is not an exaggeration. No. I don't think we got the fried chicken on ours, but it definitely comes with two full-size cheeseburgers two full-size cheeseburgers and i love how they have like oh, it's in a massive mason jar mug and the, the chicken handle. the chicken is like sitting up with its little leg like over the rim of the glass it's like sexy <laughs> this chicken is posing i love and also hate her yeah if you're in the Nashville, Tennessee area, you should check out the flip side. This retro casual burger joint offers the big fix for brunch. It's served in a f- big frosty mug with crispy bacon, skewers of olives, pickles and peppers, a skewer of chicken and potatoes, and a massive snow crab claw. Oh, my God. And they have a picture of it on their Instagram with a pug dog looking at it like, what have I, what have I done? What is this monstrosity? <laughs> Am I next? Am I next? <laughs> if you're in California, go to the attic in Long Beach, where they say, in a world where garnishing a Bloody Mary with a cheeseburger has somehow become passe, this Southern <laughs> style eatery mixes it up by swapping in a barbecue pulled pork slider <laughs> as the garnish. <laughs> So it's like a a thing of celery, a layer of bacon to like make a plate to rest the slider on top of. The whole pork is like everywhere, all over the bun. Two buns, and then they top it with pickles. I kind of love that the top of the glass is they make it into a plate, a platform. Yeah. A pulled pork platform. A pulled pork platform. If you want something a little on the sweeter side, go to the Star Bar in Austin, Texas. We aren't totally sold. It says on eating a powdered donut, a chocolate donut, and a huge cinnamon roll with our spicy tomato juice cocktail, but we'll gladly indulge in the Hail Mary's sweet garnishes afterwards for dessert. So this has, one of the skewers has like your standards, pickle, celery, there's a fucking hard boiled egg, meats, cheeses. Then it has another skewer that has tater tots chicken tenders and a full (laughs) burger on it and then a dessert skewer it's like appetizer lunch dessert the dessert skewer has a powdered donut a chocolate donut and a big glazed cinnamon roll on it if you didn't already have diabetes type three diabetes i'm (laughs) ready to get it type three (laughs) is there a type three no but i'm ready to invent it okay there isn't one yet (laughs) <laughs> challenge accepted um, it challenge accepted i'll cover one more out of pittsburgh pennsylvania at luke holy's wild alaskan grill wow it's a seafood bloody mary it says the hardest part about consuming the seafood bloody mary is getting past just how gosh darn adorable the deep fried crab looks it's just kind of peeking at you <laughs> there's another one in vancouver that has a full piece of chocolate cake on it but like also onion rings fried chicken pick it's shocking i wouldn't say I'd, no to I'd a chocolate cake garnish out of a bloody mary that actually might be a great combo i think anything that comes with a meal on a skewer with it is my cup of tea <laughs> my skewer of tea but for the purpose of this podcast being primarily in an audio medium though if you do want to see our horrifying faces you can join our patreon it's a five dollar up don't do it do, but you know do it or don't that's your call <laughs> i do have a key lime Lacroix that i can crack which i will do and then i'm going to rip some weed are you ready i'm ready <sighs> oh nice crack what are you drinking nice crack well 
So glad you asked. I was so fucking tired today. I don't mm-hmm. know why. You have a baby. Yeah. There you go. I was so tired today. So I asked Corey to bring me home a single can of Red Bull. Mm-hmm. So I'm drinking a vodka Red Bull with a splash of cranberry. And oh, I haven't had Red Bull. splash of cran. I do. I haven't had Red Bull in well over a year. So this may go down badly. If only I had a f- fried crab leg on top of it. I can't wait for you to forget to dump what you pump. And then June is just awake all night. Babe, I'm not pumping. Oh, good for you. I love that. Yeah. Then Mm-mm. no risk. Yeah. Zero risk, 100% reward. Mm-hmm. Except risking being up all night again. I don't know. Zero I have a baby. There's no risk. There's no safe way to go into the evenings. They're going to be up all <laughs> night anyway, so who I cares? Know. Cheers. Right, well, cheers <laughs> to you. Cheers to me. Cheers to Bloody Marys. Cheers to weed. Cheers to Courtney. And before we move on to your incredible segment, shall we take a moment to hear a word from our sponsors? I would love that. Let's do it. Special thanks to our amazing sponsor of this episode, Care Of, which is a health and wellness company that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to your door every month. They make it so simple. So simple. And you know what? These simple acts like taking your vitamins every day lead to the biggest differences in your health. Mm -hmm. And routines don't have to be complicated to be effective. So this spring care of is making it easier than ever to stick to a consistent routine so you can actually see results. So you just go to their website. You take their simple online quiz. We love a good quiz. It's a adorable and informative quiz it is about your lifestyle and your health goals and care of will give you doctor backed recommendations it is that easy and when your recommendations come in it tells you exactly what these things are and like what they do Mm -hmm. so you can like set your expectations and have make sure that everything aligns with your goals and then just take it away yeah that's all you got to do they come in these Cute little packs that are uh, plant-based, compostable. Love that. And they also have like a cute little prompt for the day. So like you're kind of, it's like a little fortune cookie for your morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so these pack, the packs themselves help limit the impact on the environment without compromising on the quality and safety of their products. You can feel good about taking them. You can feel good about throwing that pack away mm-hmm. or composting it. I keep my care of vitamins right above my sink in the kitchen. So when I go in for like my morning water, Mm -hmm. it's just right there. Or if I don't have time to actually like take them in the moment, I'll just throw them in my purse and take them on the road. They're great for travel. I was just going to say the travel part is honestly like my favorite part because keeping your wellness routine when you're not at home can be really hard, but the packs just make it so easy to bring it with you. It is so easy and you're not going to run out because you can sign up for a subscription. They just show up at your door. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for 50% off your first Care Of subscription order, go to TakeCareOf.com and enter code GALS50. That's G-A-L-S-5-0. One more time, for 50% off your first Care Of subscription order, go to TakeCareOf.com and enter code GALS50 and treat your wellness. Treat it. So I don't know why I was under the impression that like those detergent pods were wrapped in some sort of like material that just disintegrates and like doesn't harm the planet yeah but i was misguided mistaken i was wrong because Mm -hmm. that film around your pods is plastic and it is ending up in our oceans rivers and soil so yeah if you want to feel better about the cleaning essentials that you use every day in your home you have got Mm -hmm. to check out blue land Blue Land is amazing, and they're on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet with the same powerful clean you're used to. Let me tell you, I had, let's call it a manic episode, because that's pretty much what it was, and (laughs) woke up just determined to deep clean top to bottom, like, the entire house. I was up on a chair with a broken foot, which I really probably should have done, but that's either here nor there. Cleaning my cabinet doors. Like, I don't think those have been cleaned since we moved in in 2020. The top of the fridge. Yes. And I use all Blueland products. And let me tell you, my house is sparkling. It's stunning. I've like never felt better in my life. I'm obsessed. (laughs) 
Blue Land uses no single use plastic in any components. So that's from the bottles, the tablets, and the wrappers to the shipping. Their tablet packaging is fully compostable. Blue Land products are effective, baby. Let me tell you, my house was not clean, okay? <laughs> and now it's clean. They are effective and they're also affordable and their dishwasher tablets i swear by these this is one of my favorite products that they make they are proven to to perform on baked on burnt on stains you don't need a rinse aid i hate doing dishes and i hate hand washing things you like do. if i really do if my dishwasher's lucky the item that goes in gets a quick rinse in the sink before it goes in and that's about it so i'm putting some gnarly dishes in there and they're coming out sparkling chef's kiss baby you can get even more savings on blue land products by buying refills in bulk or you can do what i did and set up a subscription so that it just shows up and i don't have to like even put it on my shopping list because i know it's just it's coming their subscriptions are fully customizable they're so convenient you never run out of your most used products and blue land is trusted in over a million homes including ours so you don't just have to take it from us Blue Land has a special offer for our listeners. Right now, get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash gals. You won't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash gals for 15% off. One more time, that's blueland.com slash gals to get 15% off and treat yo clean. Treat it. Okay, before I get into the Huskers, I just remembered that Amanda wanted me to tell... <laughs> The other day, <laughs> I called Amanda <laughs> at about 2 p.m., 2.30, <laughs> and she answered, and I said, good morning. Oh, wait. <laughs> I was out, like, running errands or something. You were at Robbie's. Like, oh, yes, I was. I knew I was not in my house. <laughs> like, fully into your day yeah. out in public. Yeah, we were recording passages, and I fucking started laughing so hard that i started like <laughs> sobbing crying lucy almost never is the one to be the late sleeper anymore mm -mm. like I, I mean certainly not since you had a baby but even before you had your baby you were usually like up, up by nine and out of bed by nine yeah pretty consistently i'm like yeah. i wake up because i have to pee at like 8 a.m., but I will not get out of bed until I have to. Even if I'm awake, I will answer mm -hmm. emails, I'll scroll, I'll doom scroll, but I'm laying in bed for as long as I can get, like, any work done from mm -hmm. my phone. But, so, it was just so validating <laughs> and hilarious. Good morning. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait, it's 2 p.m. Granted, we all know you were not just waking up. You, you're delirious from motherhood. That was delirious, yeah. So yeah. you have an excuse, but that was so fucking funny. I know it's not <laughs> funny to anyone really well, at home, but good morning. <laughs> I just like um, to relive it. I love um, it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what is your background in psych on the hideous Huskers this fine morning at 4.45 well, p.m.? <laughs> okay. According to the U.S. Department of the Interior, Nebraska is named after a Sioux word describing the river, meaning shallow water or broad water. Okay. Uh, it also said that the name could have been derived from an Oto Native American word that means flat river. And all of this refers to the flat river that uh, goes through Nebraska. Okay. She big, she wide, she shallow. She plat. She plat. Welcome to Platteville. Mm. So Merriam-Webster says a corn husker is a nickname used to refer to people who are natives or residents of Nebraska. So mm. that's where we get huskers. Okay. From their number one crap. E Karen. Yes. Okay. So the first known use of the nickname was in 1948. Corn husker is obviously sometimes shortened to just husker. Mm -hmm. And then a husker specifically is also used to refer to a student, staff, or faculty member of the University of Nebraska Lincoln, which, by That's... the way, is a land grant school, like we talked about. Oh yeah, in whatever the fuck in, that other episode uh, was, which ha won't be out. Well, no, it would have been out by now. Uh, academic atrocities. Yes, that was land the one. grant schools because we it. talked about like why there are huge universities like in the middle of quote unquote nowhere. This would be a good example mm -hmm. or also a fan of the university's sports teams. I was really worried that Courtney was going to want 
sports, like college sports in Nebraska related if cases. Courtney and I was wanted like, that. Courtney's no. in the wrong place. <laughs> no, Courtney sent <laughs> suggestions of cases and they were not that. So I was devastated when I saw what I was covering today, but also relieved because I'd yeah. still rather cover this than Sparts. <laughs> Sparts. Sparts. I'd recover Homunculus Wagner. Oh. <laughs> yes, you would. According to the UNL admissions Tumblr page, Charles S. Sherman, a famous sports writer in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is where my dad was born. Your dad was born a Husker? Uh-huh. Well, I... he was born outside of Nebraska. Was he born in Lincoln? I don't fucking know. He lived in Lincoln at some point. Okay, <sighs> Charles Sherman, sports writer, Spartans mm-hmm. writer, was tired of the UNL's nickname, which at the time was the Bug Eaters. Ish. Okay, yeah. I don't think I'd like that nickname either. We'll get to the bug eaters. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and began referring to the football team as the Karn Huskers. Karn. Karn. The first few names of the sports teams were the Nebraskans, the Tree Planters, the Old Gold Knights, and the Rattlesnake Boys. Okay, the Rattlesnake Boys is fucking amazing. Mm-hmm, I Petition like that. Petition to change all sports teams the rattlesnake to folks. The rattlesnake boys. <laughs> no matter how you identify, once you're playing one of those sports, you're one of the rattlesnake boys. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the rattlesnake boys. There's no escaping the rattlesnake boys. <laughs> once they got the fangs in you. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Okay. <laughs> The name the Bug Eaters would be given to the team in the 1890s and managed to last the rest of the decade. So the Bug Eaters were the Bug Eaters for approximately 10 years. <laughs> the Kyron Huskers nickname was first used in the school newspaper. The name refers to the act of husking corn, an act that many Nebraskans did at the time as part of their occupations as farmers. Kyron. Say your Kyron. <laughs> Kyron. Cone. Kyron. The UNL football mascot is Herbie Husker, who is horrifying. Oh, there are God, photos there... of Herbie. Um, don't react just yet, because I've got more. <laughs> so I found this informational gem on Herbie Husker's Wikipedia page. Quote, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln cycled through several official mascots before settling on Herbie Husker. The first of these was Corn Cob Man. <laughs> Please give me Corn Cob Man. <laughs> This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Are you looking at Corn Cob Man? No, I'm looking at Herbie. Look at Corn Cob Man. Oh, there's Corn <laughs> What? <laughs> oh, the <Yes>. mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Dead eye. This is amazing. Why would you ever get rid of this? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the pants are so white. Yeah. I- <laughs> okay. Look how, so look how proudly he's standing. Shoulders yeah. back. Colonel's feet. back. Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> <Colonel's> back. <laughs> feet planted. Colonel with a part. <laughs> Colonel with a part. <laughs> Look me in the kernels. <laughs> hey, kernels up here. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so Corn Cob Man is a man in green overalls with an ear of corn for a head. <laughs> no, no. After just no. a few years, the university sought a more quote unquote representative mascot <laughs> and debuted. Husky the Husker, who was a farmer who stood 10 feet tall and wore overalls with a straw hat on top of a fiberglass head. Husky soon gave way to Mr. Husky is gross. Yeah. I hate, I fucking hate Husky. I I want corn cop, man. Leave him cold. (laughs) Leave him cold. I know. (laughs) Well, Husky didn't last long. We'll get to it. Husky soon gave way to Mr. Big Red, more commonly known as Harry Husker, 
Oh, Harry no. was equally tall, but dressed in a blazer and red, red wide brim hat. Mm-hmm. But Harry's head was so large, he couldn't fit on the team's traveling bus. And the oh. head was so heavy that the student wearing the costume had to be switched out every 45 minutes. <laughs> what? The physical demands of the Harry costume meant the university was soon looking for another mascot design. And in 1974... And you acquired the rights to Herbie Husker based on the design of Lubbock, Texas artist Dirk West. They then hired Disney cartoonist Bob Johnson to refine refine West's design into a costume. And Herbie made his first appearance at a Nebraska football game at the 1974 Cotton Bowl Classic of 19 to 3 Cornhuskers victory over Texas. This was my favorite part. Mr. Big Red wasn't officially retired until 1988 and was infrequently seen coexisting with Herbie. <laughs> Just wheel Harry out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, every once in a while to make an appearance. Y'all Nebraskans have mascot trauma, honey. <laughs> this is the worst. First of all, where y'all landed is a disaster. <laughs> you know the acclaimed film The Mask with Jim Carrey? <laughs> you know the villain guy with the really strong jaw? <laughs> the mean guy who's like yeah. trying to, who's date Cameron Diaz's boyfriend? Totally. That's especially when he does acquire and put on the mask. Oh, and it just, yeah. Like, caricaturizes his insane <laughs> bone structure. His jaw. That's Herbie Husker. <laughs> this is the grossest. I want dead eyed cord cob man back. I want him back right now. We need to start a petition. I'm getting unchanged.org <laughs> immediately. Bring back Corn Cob Man. Bring back Corn Cob Man. But I specifically want Corn Cob Man 2. Because <laughs> your picture of Corn Cob Man 1 is too detailed and advanced. Corn yeah. Cob Man 2 is <laughs> shocking. Is grainy, so to speak. <laughs> so scary. I can't. Anyway, those are my demands. Okay. That fucking took my ass out, dude. I know it did. That, I was, that, I, I, there's still moisture on my face from crying. Holy shit. (laughs) Every 45, I can't. Colonel's up here. (laughs) Hey. Colonel's up here, Buster. Okay. Don't you know you're talking to? I'm corn cob man. <laughs> <laughs> Show him some respect. <laughs> okay. According to History Nebraska, the state has had other nicknames. The earliest nickname applied to Nebraska residents was Squatters. And this well, nickname first appeared in an article from Omaha Weekly Nebraskan. Yeah. Uh, in 1860. The nickname came from the fact that many early Nebraska set- settlers moved on their claims before the land was surveyed. Yeah. So they kind of just took it over. Yep. Took it over before legally being told to take it over. Okay. Now we're going to get to the bug eaters. Okay, good. Because I was going to ask where that fucking came from. So the nickname bug eaters replaced squatters later in the 19th century, according to John A. McMurphy. The Nebraska Territorial Pioneers Association Secretary. Oh, my God. I've had one sip of this fucking drink. I can't deal with it. Did you get high through me? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Association Success and Service. Nebraska so. Territorial Pioneers Association Secretary. In November 1894, the nickname probably originated during the 1870s Grasshopper Invasion. No. Yes. They had a plague. They had several years of this plague, but the worst one was in 18... uh, 18, I don't know. We'll get to it. Grasshoppers are so big. (laughs) Okay. According to the story, an Easterner visited his relatives in Nebraska, and when he returned home, he was asked about the visit, and he talked about how people ate bugs to stay alive. Well... A Crickets are an incredible source of protein and extremely sustainable. We should all be fucking eating them. But these are grasshoppers. It's Locusts. basically the same thing. Well, I don't know about the protein 
value of a grasshopper as oh, yeah, a cricket. cricket's really not at all the same thing as a grasshopper, but they jump. They do, they do jump. Sounds. They scare you. Yeah. Okay, so a journalist heard the story and published it as a joke. This also might have been a little xenophobic and racist yep. because a lot of those first settlers were freed black Americans coming up from the South and also immigrants from Ireland, Sweden, and Germany. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... I think people kind of took to it because they're like, yeah, those stupid Nebraskans. Yeah. You know? On April 4th, 1895, a legislature passed the resolution declaring Nebraska the tree planter state in honor of its role as the originator of Arbor Day. Okay, great. I, I do have more about the grasshoppers. I'll come back to the grasshoppers because how could I not? How okay. could I just yeah. gloss over that? I know. I'm like, there's no way you didn't fixate on the grasshoppers a little bit. I fixated. Yeah. We'll get to it. Okay. According to the Britannica, the U.S. Ugh. acquired Nebraska as part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. In 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition visited the Nebraska side of the Missouri River, Missouri River, mm -hmm. and conducted the first systematic exploration of the area. Can we do Lewis and Clark crimes? Ugh, God. I think that's fascinating. Ugh. I'll do a drunk dive. During the 1840s, the Platte Valley became a major migration route as thousands of settlers moved westward to Oregon, California, and Utah over the path marked by the pre-existing fur trade. We could do colonizer crimes and talk about Lewis and Clark. Yeah. They were like explorers. Sure. There are way bigger colonizers than them. Oh, yeah. In 1854, Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois proposed a bill to organize the territory of Nebraska which would later become the states of Kansas, Nebraska, Montana, and both Dakotas. It was a huge oh. area. I yeah. have a map of this on the drive. Mm -hmm. Also known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the bill raised the possibility that slavery could be extended into these newly organized territories. Jesus. So from history.nebraska.gov, quote, when the territory was organized in 1854, it was a question of popular sovereignty. So the it was like a... It was like a democratic like a social sovereign. justice or like a social issue. Basically, like the people of that territory could decide whether yeah, or not they would allow slavery. That's what I mean. So it's like they decide if, if they're <laughs> comfortable with it or not. Yeah. It's like a it's a vote. It's like a social vote. Yeah. But because it's in the north, that would mm -hmm. that made a lot of people in the north really pissed off. They're like, why are you? you know, north of the Mason-Dixon line, mm -hmm. deciding that you're okay with slavery. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. People in the North were bitterly opposed to the extension of slavery and were demanding that Congress keep it out of the newly organized territories. Could you mm -hmm. tell that I just skipped to a new page when I paused yep. like that? Keep scroll, 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 scroll. It out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. You're doing so well. I This is, Yeah. <laughs> By 1867, the Civil War had decided the fate of slavery and the problem of the day was whether the newly freed people were to be granted the right to vote. So mm -hmm. then it's like, OK, well, obviously, we're not going to have slavery because Civil War is over. There's no more slavery. But, but do people of color have the right to vote? Right. The Nebraska Constitution originally submitted to Congress in common with the constitutions of most other northern states restricted the right to vote to white males. Mm -hmm. Women were not considered qualified to vote. Mm -mm. We're still not. Well, <laughs> you voted yesterday. <laughs> no, yesterday was Wednesday. I voted on Tuesday. Oh, OK. You're right. <laughs> Still not qualified. <laughs> I fucking rest my case, Lucy. <laughs> Only on American Idol. You're the reason. I am the reason. I am the downfall <laughs> of my gender. <laughs> Feminism. Congress, controlled by those demanding African-American suffrage, amended the Enabling Act to provide that Nebraska could not be admitted unless this restriction was removed, as in they, they didn't want... To admit Nebraska as a state unless black people were allowed to vote. Could vote. Yep. President Johnson, believing that Congress had no constitutional right to dictate to Nebraska in this fashion, vetoed the bill. Mm -hmm. Vetoed allowing statehood for Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Congress passed the bill over the presidential veto. So they were like, fuck you, Johnson. Suck we're it. Suck my suck Johnson, it. Johnson. Yep. 
In Nebraska, the legislator, the legislature elected the year before was called into a special session by Governor Alvin Saunders to consider the conditions imposed by Congress. They acted quickly to approve the conditions, convening one day and adjourning the next. It was pretty, pretty cut and dry, mm-hmm. open shut. President Johnson then proclaimed Nebraska to be a state. And to this day, Nebraska still remains the only state admitted into the union by a presidential veto override. Hmm. So that was kind of dry, but I thought that was... It's interesting. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Lewis it's and your Clark. show, babe. Yeah. Go off. On March 1st, 1867, Nebraska was admitted to the Union as the 37th state. And when this happened, the capital of Nebraska was Omaha, but the seat of government moved to Lancaster. And Lancaster, Lancaster was later renamed Lincoln after President Abraham Lincoln, who had at the time recently been assassinated, RIP, too soon. Did... Is did Lincoln become the capital? Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't. Uh, I just assumed it was Omaha. No, I think it's Lincoln because yeah, it's in the middle that, of the state. That's fine. I I'm not fighting you on it. I'm I'm saying I'm the idiot because for a while it was just like the biggest city in each state was the capital, but then right. at some point they moved them all to a city that was like closer to the middle of the state. Yeah, that makes sense. Iowa City used to be the capital of Iowa, but then they moved it to Des Moines. Mm -hmm. And Omaha is right there on the right there on the edge. It is. It is. Okay, so back to the grasshoppers. The 1870s marked the grasshopper years in Nebraska. (gasps) Great swaths of the insect. I wrote swatches, but I meant swaths of the insect had visited the land several times since 1857 but the most significant grasshopper raids happened in late July of 1874 an estimated 12.5 trillion grasshoppers trillion trillion specifically rocky mountain locusts i have a photo on the drive of a rocky mountain locust it's massive yeah they're gross invaded the settled portions of the state they Their arrived. legs are so long. Yeah, they're nasty. They uh, they arrived in swarms so large that they blocked out the sun and sounded like a rainstorm. They ate people's crops. They ate wool off of live sheep. And they ate the clothes off of people's backs. They also uh-huh. ate, like, saddles. They were attracted to anything with, like, salty sweat on them. That's why they ate, like, what? clothing. Anything uh. leather. Anything organic they would eat. Isn't that disgusting? What on earth? So everything was devoured. This also happened in the summers of 1875 and 76, but it never got as bad as the summer of 1874. At the time, many Nebraska newspapers tried to preserve the state's reputation to avoid discouraging immigration, but these efforts didn't work. No! So like I mentioned, the journalists in in the Northeast, um, newspapers in the East published unfavorable reports But they were unfavorable, but they were realistic. Yeah. (laughs) The U.S. public responded with charitable donations. Farmers seeking help. uh, Okay, so the the people started donating to all these farmers and families who had lost all their crops and their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the federal government was like, "Uh, okay, well, we can't just have like random people, you know. So this was sort of the first. uh, Well, I'll get to it. Mutual aid. Well, federal aid. Mm. Um, but it started with mutual aid because people just started donating their own money to the farmers. Yes, it started with. Yes, it did. Farmers seeking help from the Nebraska Relief and Aid Association had to swear that they had nothing left due to the attacks before they could receive assistance. Mm-hmm. Here we go. The uh, the nonprofit industrial complex gatekeeping mm-hmm. the funds. Mm-hmm. State legislatures and the U.S. Congress began appropriating funds for food, clothing, and seeds f- for the following spring. Mm-hmm. The Rocky Mountain locusts became extinct by the early 1900s due to the expansion of farming disrupting their habitat. So pretty much they had a few last hurrahs before they died out. They lashed You're out. You're telling me they really went out kicking. G- g- and hopping. jumping. Yeah. Happen. It can easily be argued that grasshopper relief efforts helped establish federal and state government roles in disaster relief and in aiding agricultural producers. It was like the first time that happened. That's wild. For happers, my God. I also read another part where uh, like steam, like trains moving Mm -hmm. through the areas with all the grasshoppers, the tracks would get so slippery with dead, crushed grasshoppers that trains would like roll off the tracks. (laughs) 
What the fuck? Yeah, it was a major no, issue. I don't like that. Thanks, nope. I hate it. There is a illustration on the drive of a farmer with a horse that has like a plow in front of it that looks like a big, um, what's it called? Snow plow. Those are all hoppers that they're scooping up? Yeah, that's a grasshopper catcher that they're scooping into that net. So they like clear oh, their yeah. fields with it. Wow. It's like a snow plow. Yeah, but yeah, it's got that mesh at the back. Mm hmm. Oh. And then there's another, there's another picture. Well, it's just of the train. Yeah, I saw but that. It, but it talks about the grasshoppers. They stopped wow. this train. That's <laughs> wild. Yeah, because they could, the train couldn't move because the tracks were so slippery. That's fucking disgusting. I, oh. Yeah. Hopper gets. On March 28th, 1925, Nebraska became the last of the contiguous 48 states to adopt its own flag. Mm. The flag oh, consists I knew we'd get to the flag. <laughs> of a dark blue background with the state seal in the center. The seal shows the Missouri River with a steamboat, a blacksmith in the foreground with a hammer and an anvil, a settler's cabin surrounded by wheat sheaves and growing corn, and in the background, a railroad train heading toward the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. Its seal also had the motto, Equality Before the Law, which refers to the right of each settler to public land as a reference to the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. Nebraska limits its seal colors to gold, silver, and blue. And lastly, I wanted to share a little bit about corn husking as an activity. Oh, my least favorite activity. I don't like all the silks that get stuck to me. Ooh, the witch hair. Ugh. That's what we call it. Yikes. Because as we note frequently on this show, shit was boring back then. Okay. You had to, you had to make your own fun. Wait, this was a fun activity back yes. in the day? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Husking or shucking is its own harvest ritual throughout the Midwest. We always called it shucking growing up. Yeah, we called it shucking. You shuck mm -hmm. the husk. Yeah. We use corn to eat by itself, obviously, to make hominy, alcohol, or hog feed. Hag. Hag feed. <laughs> husking the corn was kind of boring and repetitive, so it was and is very common for people to gather and drink and husk it together. And this husking parties was sometimes called an affair of mutual assistance. <sighs> Cute. Just because it was like a group, like people throughout the neighborhood would get together and do it. It wasn't just like one family. The family that husks together, the community husk. Mm-hmm. You could meet your husband at a community husk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At a, at a group shock. <laughs> a group shock. <laughs> A circle husk. Yep. <laughs> circle shuck. <laughs> That's some three-way shucking. Mm -hmm. Huskin naturally became competitive in many areas, including and notably in the plantation south, where people would have two team captains who chose their husking teams and raced to shuck the most corn from a four-foot-tall pile of corn. A shuck-off. It was a shuck-off. I love it. <laughs> There were a lot of songs that they would sing, and each verse would get sung faster and faster to, like, energize the contestants. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were regional variations in the husking activities, as well as differences based on other factors like wealth and probably how much corn grew in a given area. Mm -hmm. So, closing us out here with a couple of fun facts about Nebraska. Okay. That we haven't already covered. Hashtag Ugh. grasshoppers. Hashtag, hashtag corn cob man. Two. <laughs> the world's largest exhibited mammoth skeleton was found on a farm in Lincoln County in 1922. The late Pleistocene era mammoth is on display at the University of Nebraska State Museum. Ugh. On June 22nd, 2023, a record setting hailstone with a circumference of 18.75 inches. Inches fell, fell in Aurora, Nebraska. No, that could have killed somebody. The storm left craters of up to 14 inches in the ground. Craters. Yeah. F a hole this deep from the hail. Can uh, you imagine? No, that's it, terrifying. Somehow it only caused about $500,000 in property damage and $1 million in crop damage. Wow. But I mean, inflation. 
back then, that would have been a lot of fucking money. That was in June of 2023. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, it was like yesterday. I thought this was a very, 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 very long time ago and climate change had saved us from 18 foot fucking inch, whatever, hail. Nope. Probably climate making it worse. created it. Yep, there it is. Yes. Oh there she goes. Nebraska. Gonna get back to my repetitive task. <laughs> soothe your soothe your smooth brain. Smooth your brain out. I am. I have to smooth it out. In Nebraska is the birthplace of Kool Aid. Ever heard of it? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Oh yeah. Sure oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> In 1927, the juice was invented by Edwin Perkins in Hastings, Nebraska. He made his soft drink syrup into the famous powder, which made for a more straightforward shipping process. I think the body of the Kool-Aid man mascot inspired Herbie. (laughs) It inspired his head, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, they're the same shape. (laughs) So gross. I hate Herbie so much. Yeah. He's my new pale man. Ew. The Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska, is home to the largest indoor rainforest in the United States. Cool. It covers 1.5 acres of land in an eight-story building and has flora and fauna from rainforests all over the globe. So, Amanda, next time... We have to go. That sounds incredible. We go to Omaha to visit the Patreon office. We're going to the zoo. (laughs) That And we're staying in that same hotel. And we're going to swim in that fucking pool. And we're going to make friends with those drunk people and we're going to have great bombs at the bar. Yeah. And then that you're going to a lovely trip. Drunk dial M and propose to them. I did do that. That was fun. I did. That was a good time. They gave a tentative yes, but I married someone else. So that's on me. Yeah. Well, you're the heartbreaker. <laughs> those are the f- most interesting facts you ever wanted to know about Nebraska. <laughs> that is so much more than I ever knew or or wanted to know about Nebraska, but I'm very grateful for you. That was yeah. wonderful. Well done. Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know, you know? I'll never forget Corn Cob Man. No. He's changed my life. Print him out. <gasps> Print it out. Print it out. Frame it. Put it on your desk. Well, yeah, let's let's take a break to hear a word from our sponsors so I can print out Corn Cob Man. <laughs> Do you even have a printer? Yes. Oh, good. Do you have ink? I do. Yes. Oh, good. Maybe. Do you have paper? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's ink that I'm now not confident about. Well, just put a piece of paper up on your t- computer screen and trace him. Oh, It'll probably really come out smart. with more detail than the actual photograph. You're right. And then I could take it to Dave and be like, tattoo this on me <laughs> immediately. <laughs> And he'll be like, are you sure? Can I fix it a little? And he'll be like, no. No, as is. (laughs) No, I would let him reimagine it. But he also has learned to stop asking me if I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't we all? Yeah. (laughs) This comes with a friendship of more than 10 years with you. (laughs) (laughs) Most people in my life don't ask me that question. (laughs) (laughs) because yeah yeah (laughs) she's sure don't make her think too hard about it do because that's its own can of worms it ruins everything (laughs) it does it's way less fun i love not thinking things through (laughs) love it i do it makes for good tv i do almost everything on impulse yeah everything yeah and you know what i'm not dead yet (laughs) <laughs> something's working <laughs> something's, wor- something's must working must be doing something right <laughs> right she's here you own a home you're married <laughs> oh, you're you relatively healthy you got a decent yeah. job yeah oh, yeah my a1c is down to almost pre-diabetic levels Come your on. credit score oh my credit score's up mm-hmm. <sighs> what what you Impulse know when who. it's you know when it's morning and when it's not. <laughs> I know when it's morning when it's not. I know what day to vote in the primary. Mm-hmm. And I did. You've got your shit to. You're sewing your own clothing right now. So I, I'm amazing. You're very put together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your, your tracks are showing, but you're very put together. Just oh. kidding. I can't see your tracks. 
I that's because all of my hair is out. I have none. <laughs> it's all out. It's getting re re put in very soon, but you can't see what isn't there, honey. Yep. Don't know what you don't know. Anyway, nope. let's uh, take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsors, shall we? Let's do it. <laughs> If you have listened to the show, you have heard us fully proselytize about Wild Grain and how it has elevated my status as part of the neighborhood dinner, impromptu dinner party community. (laughs) Because when given a last minute opportunity to come over for dinner and I don't have to ask, what can I bring? I know I can freshly bake some, some bread. And bring it over. I'm obsessed with it. It has made everything so much more convenient and also just makes me appear a lot more put together than I actually am. Thanks, Wild Grain. That's always a blessing. It is. Wild Grain is the first ever Bake From Frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal artisanal pastries. Mm. Uh, I'm a pasta gal. I'm a yeah. big old pasta gal. And yeah. uh, the first time I made Wild Grain pasta, Corey was very doubtful. He was like, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. Your like, chef husband. My chef husband. He was like, mm, frozen pasta? Like, that's mm-hmm. that that's probably not going to be great. And then I made it. And he was like, if I didn't know any better, I would think that you had just rolled, like, rolled this out yourself. Made it like Italian grandma style in the kitchen. Yeah. Every item bakes from fro- from frozen in 25 minutes or less. There's no thawing required. It is like it's so quick. And now truly, you truly can- if you have forgotten what to do, <laughs> you can just pull it out, pop it in, babe. If your in-laws are coming over for brunch and you totally forgot about it, they just give you a heads up when they're on your when they're on their way. You can have like Croissant. Enjoy a fresh baked croissant. Yes. Uh, like Amanda said, it's going to make you look so put together. And <laughs> you can now fully customize your wild grain box. So you can choose any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries. You could build a box of only bread or Boom. only pasta, like Boom. I do, or <clears throat> only pastries. It, yeah, they, it couldn't be easier and it couldn't be tastier. Mm-hmm. And for a limited time, you can get $30 off the first box, plus free croissants in every box <laughs> when <laughs> when you go to wildgrain.com forward slash gals to start your subscription. You heard me, free croissants in every box and $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash gals. One more time, that's wildgrain.com slash gals or use promo code gals at checkout and treat your meals. Treat them. If you ask me, nothing sinks more than when the snow is melting in your neighbor's yard and a mm. winter's worth of dog turds are mm-hmm. is uncovered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, to mm-hmm. me, is the stinkiest thing that I can think of, except maybe body odor and it's even worse when it's your own and you're aware of it yeah sometimes it's like you know what i would take the dog turds Mm -hmm. yep so that's why we are very excited to tell you about lumi whole body deodorant so unlike certain other deodorants lumi is powered by mandelic acid to control odor in a new novel way Mm -hmm. lumi delivers outrageous 72 hour odor control And this isn't just for your armpits, although it's Mm -hmm. definitely effective for your armpits. You can use it on your feet. You can use it on your privates, your under boobs, your thighs. Mm -hmm. Oh, the thighs. Wherever. And in fact, it was patients' concerns about private part odor, the downstairs Mm -hmm. business, that originally inspired the OBGYN who invented Lumi. Mm -hmm. Fast forward six years and her game changing whole body Dio has now earned over 300,000 five star reviews from people like us who love feeling confident from head to toe. So we have a special offer for you. New customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code and link. So use code GALS15, that's G-A-L-S-1-5, at lumideodorant.com, L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T.com. I am obsessed with Lumi and I love their products. I mean, I know that if you've heard this show before you've heard us talk about the deodorant wipes 
They are the wipes. They're a godsend. I mean, not even just for travel, but for like those mornings when you're in between the do I really need to take a shower today or would it just be nice if I could take a shower today? The deodorant wipes. Hi, they are your best friend. I also love the whole body deodorant. It's seriously safe to use anywhere on your body. So pits under boobs. We're we're coming out of snow melt season and going into, at least in the Midwest, hot swamp, mm-hmm. <laughs> sweaty season. So the under boob, the thigh folds, the belly button, the butt crack, the vulva, the feet, all the places that are the most affected by the rising of the temperature. And as Lucy mentioned, this was created by an OBGYN who saw firsthand how normal BO was being super misdiagnosed and super mistreated. And so really all you need is just like a little helpful friend that's actually safe to use on Mm -hmm. your body. And effective. Mm -hmm. So this is clinically proven to block odor all day and for odor control for up to 72 hours, which is, it sounds unbelievable, but unlike certain traditional deodorants that try to mask odor with a fragrance, Lumi is formulated and powered by what Lucy mentioned, the mandelic acid to stop odor before it starts. So it kind of works like a pre-odorant. It's also baking soda free and paraben free. It's pH balanced for that safe use below the belt. And you can choose from a variety of fresh, bright scents like clean tangerine, lavender sage. I'm obsessed with the toasted coconut. It just makes me feel like I'm on vacation all year round. I love it. Lumi Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, a cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice, such as mini body wash. And you know we love those deodorant wipes. Mm-hmm. Also gets you free shipping. So as a special offer for our listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine the 15% off with the already discounted starter pack, that equals over 40% off of their starter pack. Mm-hmm. So use code GALS15 for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's code GALS15 at L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T dot com. And treat your bod. Treat it. You've prefaced that this case is going to be a doozy, so. Yeah, uh, this is an extra listener discretion advised situation. It's a pretty puke-inducing case. Okay. Yeah, it's bad. Okay, so... (laughs) This is the story of serial killer John Joseph Jobert, Jingleheimer Schmidt. His (laughs) name is not your name, too. This man murdered Richard Ricky Stetson, uh, who was 11 years old. Oh. Danny Joe Eberly, who was 13 years old. And Christopher Walden, who was 12 years old between the years 1982 and 1983. So he had a type. Yeah, a type. Yikes. We'll get to why it's not what you think, but okay. it's also th- still awful. Worse than what I think? <laughs> no, uh, on par, just in a different way. Okay. So he, in 1983, he was caught and sentenced to life in prison for crimes he committed in Maine and to the electric chair for the crimes he committed in Nebraska. After a series of unsuccessful appeals, Jobert was fed pizza with green peppers, onions, strawberry cheesecake, and coffee and sent to die. And I think, I don't remember exactly what, when he was uh, executed, but that's not an important detail. Green pepper and onions and sausage are my mom's favorite pizza toppings. I mean, that's a pretty standard pizza topping. It's solid pizza topping. Mm. It, was a, it was a good choice. Party cut. His final words were, I just want to say that, again, I'm sorry for what I've done. I do not know if my death will change anything or if it will bring anyone peace. And I just ask the families of Danny and Christopher and Richard Richard, to please try and find some peace and ask the people of Nebraska to forgive me. That's all. And then they executed him. Hmm. So Jobert was born on July 2nd. Uh... Sorry, Lucy. 1963 in Lawrence... The first cancer serial killer. Thing. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, and I, it, it's, it, it's very emotional how he became a serial killer. So I, it doesn't surprise me. It, it feels like cancer motivation, to be honest, for his Ooh. MO. Did someone eat his leftovers? Uh, no, but he was definitely like wronged. Okay. Mm-hmm. And 
bullied. We'll get to it. Well, we do use our emotions as weapons and sometimes apparently real weapons. It happens. Mm -hmm. His parents got divorced when he was a young kid and his mom moved him. And I think he had a sibling. Again, I didn't look that deeply to a little tiny, pretty shitty apartment in Portland, Maine. And then she had to work. And so he spent a ton of time being cared for by a beloved babysitter. Now, put yourself in the shoes of this babysitter for just a minute. Imagine you're babysitting a little boy. He's like maybe five, six years old. His parents have recently been divorced. He's really upset. He's also not. He's been told he's not allowed to go visit his father. And he blames his his mother for that. Whether it was her saying that she couldn't go see him or not is kind of unclear. But he also blames her for his parents' divorce. This kid is clearly a mess. From what I read, his mother is a pretty nasty and emotionally distant and abusive woman. But, like, you're just the babysitter. So there's really not anything that you can do. Yeah. As a side note, Jobert's band teacher, a man named Rich Petrie, who was close to Jobert and acted as kind of a mentor to him, said, quote, My impression was that the mother was cold and extremely manipulative. He was under a very, very tight leash. Now, you know how true crime media loves a cold, distant mother trope in a serial killer story, and I'm not mentioning this to put blame on her. We're responsible for our own behaviors. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it only because it was a consistent theme in the research of this case as a contributing factor of Jobert's behavior. But, like, back to the babysitter thought exercise. So... The baby, as the babysitter, you do see evidence of possible abuse or controlling behavior, emotional manipulation of this child from the mother. The house is in shambles and is like almost unlivable, just seems unsafe for a child. It's really bad. You spend a lot of time with this kid. You try to be nice to him and be as helpful as you can. And then you catch the boy looking at you weird a couple of times, but you don't too really think too much about it because, like, kids are strange and creepy. Oh, my God. But, like, what you don't know is that this little boy that you're babysitting, jo- John Joseph Jobert, age six, is fantasizing about killing and eating you. Oh. Uh, that young. Six? Yeah. Like, killing and eating you in an abstract way? <laughs> I don't really know what way, but a way that that's not usually what a six-year-old in the 80s is thinking about. Not in the 80s, the 70s, 60s. Wow. 60s. I had a dream I had to eat June's leg, but I didn't do it. That was just a dream. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) I didn't do it. Uh (laughs) I mean, all this to say, tell a trusted adult if you see a child, like if you're babysitting and you see a child in conditions like this, it's okay to tell someone in case that family needs help. Mm -hmm. So Jobert was a miserable kid. He was picked on. He was isolated and ostracized. And as the world outside his head got worse, he would retreat further and further into the realm of his own violent fantasies. Jesus. He flew under the radar, though, because academically he did well. He was on honor roll. He ran track. He played the clarinet in the marching band. He joined Boy Scouts. Like, he was just outwardly doing well normal yeah but he couldn't get away from abuse from his peers or in his home no jobert was also a physically small person so even after puberty he had stayed pretty small he had a very thin frame and he had a meek personality to go with his small stature so no matter how much physical and social abuse that they would dish out his peers jobert could not defend himself or he he either couldn't physically or he simply chose not to Mm. According to his former Spanish teacher, Francesca Bergen, Jobert was, quote, a little boy all through his high school years, adding that a lot of kids are picked on, but they seem to defend themselves. I think because John did not defend himself. I wonder if he thought he deserved that kind of abuse that he would get the shoving, the names, you know, the teasing. And then obviously a kid that's not defending himself is vulnerable. And so people are just going to keep picking on him. Yeah. And if I'm not blaming him, this these are just things that are were noticed a as this, he was experiencing this bullying. This isn't yeah. to say, well, if you let them pick on you, then it's your fault. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Absolutely not. But uh, yeah, I'm wondering if like, because he was abused at home, A, well, like you said, that maybe he thought he deserved it on some level and maybe on some level he kind of got a little bit of like comfort out of it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Like, oh, this could've. is what happens. This is normal. This is regular. This is my security. Yeah. I mean, the kid was already pretty unwell by the, at this point, by the time, mm-hmm. like, the bullying was really escalating in his middle school into high school years. So something, this guy could be an entire case study, but, like, that's not what we do on this show. So. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh my god, it would be an, <laughs> it would be a mess. You would learn nothing. <laughs> what a waste of time. What a waste of your time, guys. I mean, you can listen to it if you want to, but like, <laughs> yikes. So this was around the time when the bullying gets really, really, really bad. When Jobert's fantasies of violence really blossom, it's pretty textbook from a psychological standpoint. He's small. He's helpless. He's powerless. He's bullied. He's likely suffering from copious undiagnosed mental illnesses that could easily have been caused by consistent trauma and or these mental health conditions could have existed simply in addition to the trauma that he was experiencing. It kind of turns into like a snake eating its own tail or like a what came first, the chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. But all of this can combine into like a horror soup because it's just left untreated and your thoughts get away with can get away with you and or from you and it can get scary. Horror soup is not good. Not, not ideal. <laughs> not delish. So he starts fantasizing about inflicting these feelings of powerlessness, fear and pain onto others, specifically others who resembled the bullies of his childhood. So young boys. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. there we go. Jobert cooperated after he was arrested and confessed fully after his capture so we do have a lot of detail about his like descent into madness and what he did to his victims and it had been going on for a while like this is a laundry list of red flags and it really speaks to how poorly cared for he was it sounds like both at home and even at school because any of the adults in the room were really very clearly not protecting him. I mean, he was experiencing abuse from his own mother, but like you heard from these teachers, they fucking knew that he was being bullied and they were like, yeah, I didn't really defend himself anyway, moving on. Like, yeah. And it was, you know, what are you going to do at at this point? It's like the late seventies. So I don't know what's in place in schools at that time when it comes to bull- like protecting kids from bullying. I don't know mm-hmm. what kind of, you know, actual criteria they had or like protocol they had for that, if any. Mm-hmm. So I just think that this, I, I have empathy for the childhood of this horrifying man because I'm a fucking human being, but I'm more angry at the people who just let these red flags sprout up everywhere and no one really looked at this and went uh this is getting really fucking dangerous we need to shut this down and like get him some help yeah the blame was just sort of shifted into different like yeah so like he is to blame for all of this and the blame is shared Mm -hmm. among his community of adults that were not intervening so when he was 13 he went on a bike ride and as he passed behind a young girl he found himself overcome with a violent impulse to take a sharpened pencil out of his school bag and stab her in the back with it as he rode by on his bike. Ooh! Just jabbed her. This was one of his earliest memories of feeling sexually stimulated by inflicting pain on others and Mm. other people's pain in general. He recounted feeling aroused when she cried out in pain. From the sharpened pencil, he escalated his bike by assaults. The next time, his weapon of choice was a razor blade slashing a young girl as he biked by. Oh my God. And both assaults, he moved quickly enough that no one positively identified him for the attacks because he was on his bike and he would just like swipe and go. Yeah. And probably in that the 60s or whatever, where he was growing up, there are kids on bikes fucking everywhere. Everywhere. He could have easily blended into a crowd of biking children. It's like Dennis from the, the Sandlot. Yeah. Yeah. So this also establishes something pretty vital about his MO. He did want to hurt others. He got gratification from hurting others, but he was terrified of the consequences and went to great lengths to avoid detection, capture, and repercussions. So a cancer. mm -hmm. (laughs) Doesn't want to get in trouble. Does not. If he is to be believed in all of his confessions, his fatal attacks on the boys later in his life were about inflicting pain and that the actual killing was mainly motivated by a desire not to be caught, which is a detail that feels so sickening and dehumanizing and self-preserving 
like I harmed you because it got me off. I killed you so that I wouldn't get caught. Yeah. It's just such a horrifying combination. Kind of splitting it up in a really sick way. Mm-hmm. In another incident when he was still young, I mean, at this point, he's like in high school. He's like a young teenager. He beat up an eight-year-old boy and nearly strangled him to the point of unconsciousness. Oh, my God. This was the first time we saw this guy targeting specifically younger, physically weaker individuals. Oh. It's like for hand-to-hand combat. It wasn't just like a, a drive-by jab. Mm-hmm. It seems that the boys that he killed were not targeted for any deeply complex reason. According to his own recounting, he simply killed these boys because like they were there, they were smaller than him, and he had been picked on by other boys around that age for that exact same reason because he was little and he didn't fight back his entire life. So he wanted to like subconsciously or psychologically, he's like continuing this pattern and then up the ante for his own gratification to kind of get back at the, at the kids who had hurt him Mm -hmm. around the Woodford, Nebraska area reports of a so-called Woodford slasher begin to circulate. Multiple people were slashed. They were stabbed or they were cut in, like, random walk-by events. Jesus Christ. And it's important to note that this is all happening around the time we're going to get to it here when he... So he had been, like, committing these attacks. He graduated high school. Out of high school, he, like, joined the Army or the Navy or something, and they stationed him in Nebraska. So around that time, these reports are starting to pop up. Everyone survives these slashings. There are no life-threatening injuries, but there is, you know, according to the public, like a lunatic going around cutting and slashing people at random, which weirdly enough happened to Tina Fey. What? Yeah. She wasn't like a victim of the Woodford slasher because she wasn't in this time, in this area, or it wasn't in this time frame. But when she was a five-year-old girl, little kid growing up in Pennsylvania, she was playing in her front yard and a stranger, like some random dude, came up and slashed her face with a razor. Oh, my God. And she God. thought that he had written on her with a marker until she, like, saw the blood. And that she, uh. if you look at photos of her, she has a scar on her face that goes from almost all the way up to her ear to almost her her lip. Oh, my God. That's what it's from. People are fucking unhinged. And she, she in a couple of interviews she gave, she was like, yeah, I didn't have, like, any residual trauma about this until as a kid until i got into like acting and improv and then people are like so critical of your fucking face wow that I'm gonna she put was the picture like, on the drive of her face scar yeah she was like it was it pissed me off because directors or photographers whatever would you know talk about her quote-unquote good side and want her to like cheat away like hide her scar she's like i never had a problem with my fucking scar oh my until, god like, other people had a problem with my scar and now she's like fuck that you know i'm fucking tina fey i'm not you know i don't have a problem with my scar anymore well, but when you're like producing and whatever your yeah. own shit <laughs> like she's but yeah out. isn't that isn't that a wild story like people that are fucking is. unhinged just slicing a baby's face like a toddler's face and in, in in while it's playing in the yard like she was five who the fuck? she was five she was five fucking years old that's so gross anyway ugh. in a surprise to no one the slasher was fucking jobert and he later said in an interview that this moniker of the Woodford slasher made him feel powerful and actually emboldened his attacks. Mm, great. Which confirms what we've definitely said before. Lots of people have talked about this, that like giving sickos like this a cool nickname in the press is mm-hmm. not the move. Mm-mm. And that's specifically what happened in this case, where in Jobert's mind, he's carrying out these attacks to reclaim his like lost strength. So getting this recognition and formidable nickname just serves as validation in what he's doing and confirmation that he's successfully terrorizing people and it just pushed him further. Like he himself said that he was like reading that in the press made me want to do it more because it made it like exciting. It's a reward. And he was still in high school when he was committing or like he had just graduated high school when he was committing these assaults. So he's like 19 or 18 at the at the youngest like, think of being that impressionable age and doing this lone wolf bullshit and seeing your story in the press like that. Like, you're fanning the fucking flames. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We can't... The press really shouldn't fucking do that shit. So, 
circling back, he had graduated Catholic high school in 1981. He flunked out of college this like the same year in the fall and he returned home and was doing odd jobs. And for a while, everything seemed quite mundane, but it, it wasn't like inside he was ramping up his behavior and it was like reaching a peak and he's fucking doing these slashings. Like outwardly he seems chill, but he's a mess. And there's no way that's not going to escalate. No. So this is when the first murder occurs. Oh wait, no, he hadn't moved yet. Sorry, I have some of this stuff out of order. So the Woodford slasher stuff is after he had moved. The first murder actually occurred right before he graduated. So the first murder still occurred in Maine. But like no one in Nebraska knew about this, obviously. He murdered someone while he was in high school? Yes. Oh. So this is Richard Stetson, whose family and friends, whose family and friends called Ricky. He was aged 11. And the details of Ricky's murder are so devastating so it's august 22nd 1982 ricky left home to go exploring on a three and a half mile long trail called uh back cove trail near portland maine so yes we're still in maine we're gonna get to nebraska i did kind of switch up the order a little bit it happens i didn't misunderstand the assignment we're good it's fine witnesses who had been in the area that evening recalled seeing a red-headed boy in gray sweatpants out jogging so like he sometimes would go exploring sometimes he was just jogging on the trail like he's you know he's 11 he's just like out getting some exercise many of them also recalled that another young man or young boy or older boy with dark hair was riding behind him on a 10-speed bicycle ricky did not come home after his jog and his parents called the police and a motorist found his body the next day on the side of the interstate just like tossed oh my god initially the death is thought to be a hit and run but after examination it becomes horrifically clear that the boy had been stabbed to death and the autopsy would show that he had technically died of asphyxia by manual strangulation but Ricky had also been stabbed in the chest and had been bitten in the calf. Mm. And his attacker had slashed at the bite mark in an apparent attempt to hide it or ruin it as evidence. Oh, bite mark. Mm -hmm. Ricky had been undressed and redressed, but there was no evidence of sexual assault. And Jobert would say in interviews later or in his confessions that he would relieve himself of the sexual tension that his murders engendered later and not during the act or immediately after the act. So it was very calculated with the bite mark thing, with the not ejaculating near thing. Uh -huh. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. <sighs> God. So in December of 1982, three months after Ricky's murder, Jobert leaves Portland, Maine. He joins the air force that brings him to Nebraska and, you know, the slashings are starting. But then there's also a murder in ne in Nebraska. So sorry, are the slashings between Maine and Nebraska like ever connected before he's caught? Mm -mm. Mm. Nope. No one saw anything that he he. Yeah. Until he got caught for these murders, they did. He he confessed that he had done those slashings. OK, so but no, no law enforcement agency was like, well, there was a slasher here. Now there's a slasher there. But I guess if Tina Fey was slashed by a separate person. <laughs> well, Tina Fey was slashed by a separate person. That was a totally different time and place. He wasn't slashing in Maine, but he was stabbing with the pencil. He was like a little younger and he did like the little razor jab. Oh, but he didn't yeah. get caught for that either. The jumping around. OK. Yep. And then he... Slat like fully starts doing the slasher attacks after he moves to Nebraska. I should I put that in the wrong order. And after he already murdered a child. and after he'd already murdered someone either like during high school or right after high school, and that's before he'd gone to college. So like he was still high school age. He killed that kid. So maybe this this the slashing now that he's moved to Nebraska is more of like a way to satiate so it he might doesn't have been. murder again. It it might have been. Yeah. God. So September 18th, 1983 in Bellevue, Nebraska, which is a few miles south of Omaha, Danny Joe Eberly, a paper boy, had risen around 6 a.m. to do his paper route of about 70 houses. Complaints come to the parents of Danny uh, from a bunch of people because they were pissed that they hadn't gotten their newspaper yet. And that's when his parents are like, uh, something's not right. He's oh, never God. late. 
So they realized that their son had only delivered papers to the first three houses. Hmm. Inside the gate at the address of his fourth delivery location, his bicycle was discovered along with the rest of the newspapers still like rolled up and in his paper bag. There appeared to be no sign of a struggle. Investigators and his parents were at that point holding out hope that this was just like something distracted him and he wandered off a kid without attention span. Like that's what the cops are saying. Like there's no sign of foul play. He probably just ran off with friends or whatever. There were no other clues found at the scene. His sister, however, did not buy the Danny wandered off theory and said, quote, he was responsible. He didn't just blow off paper routes to go play with friends or something. She also reiterated that he loved his bike way too much to leave it behind because he'd spent his own money that he'd saved up doing odd jobs to buy like that bike and all these little accessories for it. Why is that like the saddest part? This I know. little boy who just loved his bike. That was Mm -hmm. like the red flag. Oh. Yeah. God. Yeah. So Danny's brother, also a paper boy, had not seen anything that day. But when questioned, remembered the feeling that a guy in in a car, like they'd felt like somebody was following them and they turned and looked and a guy in a tan car had been following the older brother on his route the last couple of days. And Jobert would later admit to the attack and said that he approached Danny after seeing the boy rolling the newspapers and had followed him as he started his route and then taken him at knife point in the front yard. He tied him up and drove away with him in the trunk of his car. So there wasn't like a struggle at the scene because he came toward him with a knife and scared him. And so the kid like did what he said because he had a weapon. Mm -hmm. According to Jobert, Danny had nearly convinced him to let him go. After Jobert had injured Danny the first time, Danny said that if Jobert took him to the hospital, he wouldn't tell anyone about the attack. And Jobert almost agreed, but his fear of being caught overwhelmed him. And again, that's just according to Jobert, but it shows that fear of apprehension was a huge concern. So he slashed him once and almost let him go. Yeah. Oh, God. At least once. The slashing is so fucking gross. Yeah. It's really creepy. Ugh. After a three-day search, Danny's body was discovered in a patch of high grass alongside a gravel road, uh, just about four miles from where the bike had been left. Dan- okay, the details are rough. Danny had been stabbed nine times with two additional wounds post-mortem in an attempt to cover up bite marks, just like he did in Maine. Danny also had a strange star-shaped pattern carved into his chest, showing an evolution of his MO. Three months later, in a similar area of... Uh, Nebraska, Christopher Walden did not arrive for classes on a Friday morning, and that wasn't normal. And so folks went out to look for him, and he was found killed in a nearly identical attack. The star he, thing? Mm-hmm. He so was abducted. So he's, like, carving a star in his chest? Yeah, or it's, or, or like, stabbing in a star-shaped pattern. So it's a signature of some kind? Seems to be. hmm He was abducted on his way to school at knife point and found with uh, all these stab wounds. Um, Also, as with Danny, witnesses claim to have seen a white man in a tan car on a walkway near the school where Chris went to school. So he was likely stalking him for a few days like he was with Danny's brother, Danny and his brother while they were on their paper route. June is never leaving the house. I'm sorry. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. (laughs) I never In his later confession, Jobert said that he had driven up to Walden as he walked, showed him the sheath of his knife, and ordered him into the car. So this is probably what he also did to Danny. Mm. After driving to some railway lines out of town, he ordered Walden to strip to his undershorts, which he did. But then Walden refused to lie down in the snow. And after a brief struggle, Jobert overpowered and then stabbed him. After killing Chris, Jobert said he attended a Boy Scout meeting where he was an assistant scout leader. Oh, for where the God's troop, sakes. With other boys. Other boys where the troop discussed the, like, slashings and abductions. Stop. Investigators had been alerting the local public after Danny was abducted to a possible threat, and they had no idea that threat, these Boy Scouts... None of them had any clue that that threat was the assistant troop leader in the room with them that had just killed one of their classmates that day. Ew. Yeah. 
Holy shit. That's so gross. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Chris's uh, snow-covered body was discovered three days later, five miles from the town, by a pair of pheasant hunters. The condition his body was found in was absolutely horrific. These details are really hard to hear, so I'm just going to power through them. But they show, like, the intense violence of Joe Bert's attacks and just they were just getting worse. Okay. So Chris was stabbed seven times and his throat was slashed so deeply that he was nearly decapitated. There were additional cutting wounds inflicted post-mortem on his chest and stomach, and they might have been in the similar like star-shaped pattern that Danny had. There's more, but I literally could barely read it, so I didn't include it. But like that was what I could possibly get through. Again, there was no evidence of sexual assault. At the scene where the body was found, there were two f- sets of put- footprints that led up to the scene, but only one set when leaving the scene, which indicated to investigators that there was no accomplice. This is one person taking one victim at a time and, and operating alone. And marching them into the woods to their death. Yeah. <sighs> so on the morning of January 11th, 1984, at approximately 8.30 a.m., A teacher at the Aldersgate Preschool in Northeast Sarpy County was preparing for the day. She observed a car driven by a person that she would later identify as Jobert looking from his car into the windows of the school. He stopped momentarily. He looked at the teacher and then he turned around and he drove off. But several minutes later, she noticed that he had driven back. He did not drive up to the window this time, but rather sat a short distance from the school looking at her for a few seconds. Concerned, she wrote down the license plate number of the vehicle and watched it drive away again. But then a few minutes later, the vehicle turns around and drives right back up to the building. So this is the third time now that he's driven up. This time, Jobert got out of the vehicle and came to the front door of the school asking for directions. And she had seen him coming, so she went and met him at the door. She gave him the directions that he requested. Um, And then he claimed he couldn't understand her directions and he asked to come in and use the phone inside the school. She says there's no phone inside the school. Now, this is the 80s. So, like, I could see this being either it's just a small town, little rural Nebraska school and they really don't have a phone or she's lying and it's like, there's no fucking phone here. Get out of here. I'm not letting you in. Either way. Is this in Bellevue also? This is in. I, it's yeah, I think it's in or around Bellevue. It's at the Aldersgate Preschool in Northeast Sarpy County, but it's in uh, like a rural part of Nebraska it's outside not of that Omaha. rural. It's just south of Omaha. I mean, I don't know how it was in the eighties. I went to a mm-hmm. wedding there last summer, mm-hmm. but I can't imagine they didn't have a phone there. That yeah, was either just way, a lie she's like she told. Yeah, she's like, we don't have a phone. I'm not letting you in. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that he couldn't just walk in to a school. I know. I mean, if this teacher hadn't been clocking him coming up and around, Mm -hmm. he probably could have just walked in. Mm -hmm. She's like in the right place at the right time and actually fucking taking things seriously. And I appreciate that about her. Yeah. So she won't let him in. He pushes her back inside of the room and says, get back in there or I'll kill you. Like he pushes his way in and pushes her into her room. The teacher pushes Jobert out of the way, runs by him down the street to a nearby home where she calls the cops. So maybe they really didn't have a fucking phone. Maybe it was just like this tiny little schoolhouse. Who knows? Wow. Either way, this teacher is a fucking hero. She gave the police the license number of the car that she had seen and also indicated that the person in the car looked like a composite sketch of the suspected killer of the two young boys that had been starting to circulate over the last like few weeks in the newspaper. So did she not have students in her classroom at that point? I'm not sure whether or not she did, but I I think she did. Huh. Yeah. Okay. They tracked the car that she reported back to a dealership that had rented it to John Jobert, a 20-year-old radar technician at the Offutt Air Force Base, while his own tan car was in for repairs. If you remember, witnesses had seen a tan car stalking Danny, the paper boy. A search warrant was executed for his car and his barracks because he was still living on the base. Oh, my God. They discovered rope identical to what was used to tie up victims, a hunting knife consistent with the wounds of his victims, and a stack of what were described as, quote, racy detective magazines. Oh, I got a box of those in my basement. (laughs) Great. Well, he fucking did, too. Well, they're from creep. Corey's grandpa had them. They're like 
really erotic, really problematic. Mysteries. Yeah. Just like mostly about like police and like women being raped. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yuck. Not great. Really yuck. Very, very 70s. Yeah, very of the time. Mm hmm. In a f coincidence, bizarre, calculated, I'm not sure. One of these magazines even contained a story about the murder of a paperboy. Oh, it, my God. It could have been a fantasy was, then. It easily could have been. I mean, he did get information from these magazines. He said it was in these magazines that Jobert learned about bite mark matching and tactics in covering such evidence and probably learned about some DNA the stuff. I mean, it was the stuff. 80s. Uh, well, they still had like not mitochondrial DNA. The DNA where they could just tell, like... Or at least blood typing. Yeah. You know? Like, just don't leave anything at the scene. Or anticipated advancements in that technology. Because they definitely did, had that. Yeah. So the rope that they found was the smoking gun as far as physical evidence. It was really distinct rope. Like, it's common white nylon on the outside, but it, the core is made up of 24 different fiber types in 106 different colors that are all weaved together inside. Oh, it's like recycled material rope, like really I'm unique? Not I mean, it was really unique. I'm not sure if it was recycled material that was in there, but this particular rope was manufactured jointly for the United States and South Korean militaries. Oh, wow. Uh, mm hmm. Didn't think that one through Jobert. Yeah, so it's like a military grade rope, and it's a very distinct type of rope. And once oh you cut God. it open, it looks very common on the outside, but when you examine it, it's distinct. Dang. So because of the kidnapping aspect of these cases where the boys were taken from one place and then killed in another, that adds kidnapping charges. And then this also allows for the FBI to become involved, and it could, they could get more resources than the, just the state level. So the case was literally used as a profiling, like a psychological profiling exercise at Quantico in Virginia. Ooh. And so they're doing this exercise and a police officer from Portland, Maine was <gasps> there for educational purposes for like career advancement, whatever, for, as a detective and was familiar with the, ki the killing of Ricky in Maine. And if they had not had that class, and that hadn't been a case study in the class. They might not that have connection it. might not have ever been made, or certain not. I wouldn't say ever. I think once technology improved, even just for connectivity, because this was an out of state, like their main Portland, Maine, and fucking Omaha, Nebraska police forces are not talking to each other, mm -hmm. and there's no like wide online database mm -hmm. where they can go. Okay, here are the details. Does this match anything else that's happening around the country? They don't have that at this point. That is a wild coincidence. Isn't that a wild fucking coincidence? Yes, so yeah, he, I love he, it. He linked the case to Ricky in Maine. Wow. Under the weight of all the evidence that they had, Jobert confessed within hours after his arrest, giving graphic detailed accounts of the killings that he had committed. He divulged that as his attacks proceeded, he would think about letting them go, but become afraid of getting caught if he did. So he had that moment of... Should I stop? Should I let him go? Almost every time. And then mm, didn't. So he was sent to Maine to stand trial for Ricky's murder first. And they secured a life sentence for him in case anything went wrong with the Nebraska cases. But as we know from the opening, it did not. In Nebraska, he was sentenced to death by electrocution. Killing to cover up a crime is also, quote, a significant aggravating factor and a big contributor to his death penalty death penalty sentence along with the, quote, senselessness and brutality of the crimes. So he may not have been, like, quote, unquote, qualified for the death penalty if but the boys had died as a result of the attacks. Even if he was, like, trying to kill them intentionally, the charge, there's an additional charge, especially if, you, if it can be proven or you confess that you committed murder to cover up a crime that, like, yeah. adds another layer of even yeah. if you were already planning to kill that person, it just it's like being able to stack all these charges. Yeah, it's kind of like when you first said that initially, it's like you're separating this this crime overall into like two separate crimes. Correct. It's sick. Yeah. Wow. 
Jobert was apparently remorseful about his crimes, but simply unable to stop himself, according to him. From an interview in 1996, quote, the murders provided uh, material for the violent fantasies. That's all the gratification it was. I can't do anything except apologize, and I am sorry. It shouldn't have happened. It was the power and the domination and seeing the fear that was more exciting than actually causing the harm. And even while in prison, he was found to be drawing depictions of boys being tied up and stabbed on, like, pieces of scrap paper and toilet paper. Oh, my God, the desperation. Yeah, it's... Which, like, to me... And again, this does not absolve him of fucking anything, but to me kind of affirms what he said, that it had become, like, impulse. Like, he couldn't stop. A complete the, fixation. Yeah, it, if you're literally grabbing at any paper you have to draw out these fantasies. Yeah. There's it. I want to believe that nobody is beyond some kind of healing, but if he were not sentenced to death, I would never in my life want this man to walk free ever. Mm -mm. Fuck no. Mm -mm. So yeah, it's just wild and like we will never be rid of horrors like this entirely because human beings are fucked up but like that's why i get so angry because i do think that they're the only way we could ever get rid of horrors like this is if we are really coming at society from like a holistic restorative and preventative perspective mm -hmm. because like i was saying earlier this guy showed this as a kid showed so many red flags throughout his life and like it really makes you wonder if he could have been prevented from doing these things if only someone had cared to fucking look more closely at this, like, abused and bullied boy who liked to fucking stab people. Yeah. Well, back to the babysitter. Did yeah. Did he admit that, like, after he was he, caught? Uh, yeah, I think he talked. That was something he discussed in... He liked to talk, it sounded like, before he was executed. So was there any I think he gave that information. Well, that was, like, a little bit of, like, cannibalism fantasy there. Mm -hmm. Was there any evidence yeah, that there, there was... Yeah, there were bite marks... There were bite marks on all of his, all the boys he killed. But he didn't, like, take a bite out of them or anything. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think there's additional, it's not like he was, I don't think he was, like, eating. Mm -hmm. But there's still but, that fantasy there of mm -hmm. biting, at least. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, wow. thanks for the suggestion, Courtney. That's a really wild case, and I'm kind of surprised I've never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. But also, like, paper boys in the 70s and the 80s. No one was fucking safe. Johnny Gosh. Yeah. I know. Wow. Jesus Christ. Well, yep. thanks for that, boy snatcher. Jesus. Welcome. Yeah. Sorry. My child is he's never dead. going outside. <laughs> no. He's <laughs> dead. And as you know, I do not support the death penalty, but I will not lose a wink of sleep knowing that this person doesn't breathe the same air as anyone else on planet earth anymore at like, least can sorry. never harm another yeah child or person literally so Ooh. yeah that's my case cool well aside from the red bull i'm gonna sleep great tonight and uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah good thing you're not sleeping because then you can't have bad dreams exactly See? I'm helping. Everything is going to be fine. Yeah, I'm really helpful. Cool. Well, thank you, Courtney Lombardo, for your fan pick, I guess. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Kind of. We'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Kala Yip. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Our production manager is Andrea Gardner. For photos and sources, check out our blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials at Wine and Crime Pod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support, Support and get access to all sorts of wine-fueled bonus content, visit our Patreon page. Cheers!
Whether you're looking to build a website for your business, your hobby, your podcast, or just for fun, Pair Networks is your go-to web hosting partner. Not only do we have the lowest domain price in the industry, starting at just 11 bucks, we've got hundreds of stunning website templates to help you stand out from the crowd. You're not a techie? Not a problem. With our easy DIY site builders, you can launch your impressive website without any technical know-how. And when it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. P-A-I-R dot com.